Good afternoon and welcome once again to Have We Got Planning News For You. Thank you very much indeed um, for joining us. Uh, welcome to our YouTube viewers. Please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, to get all our updates at the earliest opportunity. Um, and can I give you our, our usual reminder to consider making a charity donation either to our uh, charities of choice, the NHS Combined Charities Just Giving page uh, or Shelter, or if you prefer to a uh, local charity of your choice. Now, our special guest this week is Jules Pipe. Jules, hello. Good evening. Um, thank you for joining us. Jules, as, as viewers will know, is the Deputy Mayor of London uh, for Planning, Regeneration and Skills. Um, your brief includes the brand, literally brand new London brand, hot off the virtual press, published last week, in which we're really looking forward to discussing uh, with you. Also, the first directly elected Mayor of Hackney during a, a great time of, of transformation in the borough, including the Olympics. You might have guessed, Jules, where I am. Um, by the way, um, legally, this is my uh, daily recreation. Um, now, can you tell us, Jules, um, where are you uh, and what are you drinking this evening? Uh, I'm at home. Uh, I'm at home in Hackney um, and uh, I'm drinking tea, but I am obviously being uh, supporting my local borough. This mug actually was the very first one. This is the prototype. I love Hackney mug of which many, many, many tens of thousands were sold. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was the that nice was sport the one. That's the other one. I've, I've got plenty of other merch though as well. <laughs> <laughs> Famous Hackney weekend as well. If people want t-shirts, badges, badges galore. We've shift, we shift. Uh, we shift about fifty thousand of those a year, I think. Amazing. Superb. I'm, I'm Tatiana's going to be so. My wife is the biggest, well, second biggest Hackney fan in the world, I think, after your good self. So, uh, Tatiana will be thrilled about this. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us. We're, we're really very privileged to have you on, particularly so recently after the adoption of the London Plan and when um, there's so many topical things to talk about, which we're really looking forward to doing in the, in the second half of the show. As I say to all the guests, um, stick around in the first half. You, no obligation to say anything. If you did want to say anything while well, we're talking through the various cases, you're more than welcome to. I don't think there's a London case involved. I think most of them are in different parts of the country, but um, we're really looking forward to the discussion that Sasha's going to leave with you in the second half. And in the meantime, let's introduce um, the panel. Um, so, M Mary, first of all, uh, you're Mary, in town. I'm, I, I'm in town, Legal. Well, good afternoon, Charlie. I, I tell you, it's going to be very difficult not to really laugh because your hair is taking off from time to time. And it reminds <laughs> me of a mad professor. And it's I'm really quite entertaining. It's quite entertaining. But anyway, back to me. <laughs> yes. Good evening, everybody. Mary Cook, Town Legal. I'm also drinking tea jewels, but out of a, t out of a tun, out of a town mug. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to discussing all things London later. Fantastic, Mary. Great to see you. Uh, Chris, how are you? I'm very well. I'm at home for the first time doing a virtual inquiry. It's a bit weird, isn't it? You can sort of, you know, keep preparing all morning and then just uh, nip for a shower 10 minutes before you appear. It's uh, all a bit too relaxed. Nobody else does that. Clearly, nobody's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> you keep just me the then. Just you me then. Uh, here, babe, yes. <laughs> yeah, those, and uh, uh, so uh, Hackney theme, uh, part of the Olympics was obviously in Hackney. So uh, Presumption is wearing his Olympic uh, badge, uh, his Olympic cap. And uh, I'm a big fan of this guy, <laughs> uh, Daley Thompson, which is uh, part of the merchandise I picked up. I managed to get tickets for Super Saturday. Wow. We were about five rows back. It was absolutely amazing. <laughs> So I've been having my inquiry against my uh, my fellow stablemate uh, Hugh Richards. We've got John Walcock as the inspector, and it's all very civilised. And your hair's oh, hilarious. I was I'm proving it's, it's not a wig. Somebody's already said in the chat, I need a hair band. It probably won't come as a surprise. No, I've got a few. Um, on, on that note, Paul, how are you with your hackney carriage? Uh, it's not mad professor time, Charlie. It's Donald Trump coming down the steps with a plane on the <laughs> Oh, that's below the belt. Uh, so anyway, cheers, cheers, Charlie. <laughs> cheers, Jules. Um, I, I've got some London pride, which you can probably just about see. And I got the memo about Hackney about 20 minutes ago. So hence the reason for this, making a brief appearance, a Hackney carriage, which will have a bale of hay in the in the, the roof, as every, every good lawyer knows that they must. Um, so I'm in Lancashire from Kings. Looking forward to uh, chats about the London plan. And I'm getting rid of the, the taxi cab now. Thanks. <laughs> cheers, Paul Sash. How are you? Yeah, good afternoon, Charlie. I, I think Donald Trump is probably more apposite than Mad Professor. <laughs> just, yeah, just, I, just, 
I don't want to give Jules heart value at the thought of Trump visiting Acme, but um, I, 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 I'm in I'm in Fleet Street, London. Uh, my Hackney is I've got my Hackney half badge, which I finished in 2018, and I completed my PB in Hackney. I've never felt older though. Hackney felt very young and hip when I was leaving the half, but I had a great afternoon. So I've got very happy memories of Hackney, and I hope to do it again. Great marathon apart from the Olympic stage and Miss Torturous at the end. But, um, uh, no. Dear Sasha, uh, well, Charlie Butter here. Uh, I've actually lived in Hackney for seven of the last 10 years, including when Jules was mayor. So I think this makes you the first of my <laughs> former elected representatives to be on the show. So uh, an added, added uh, element of interest. So um, no, I'm, I'm in Hackney. I got the message you said about an hour ago that Hackney was the theme and that was just enough time to get over here and, and walk back home. Um, so very pleased to, to be here um, in Hackney. And I'm drinking London Pride. Um, which hopefully you can see there, the, the obvious choice of, of beverage for this evening. Now, onto the serious stuff, first of all, and we've got um, four cases to get through, um, one High Court case and two planning appeals. And um, Sa uh, no, Mary, you're going to kick off with the Abbots Kurzweil um, a High Court judgment issued this morning. So this case is hot off the press, and uh, Rob will put it up on the uh, screen. This is a, a, a decision today of Mrs Justice Lang, who dismissed... Uh, the challenge by Abbots Kurzweil Parish Council to a Secretary of State decision that was made in June last year on a recovered appeal. And regular viewers will remember this because this was a mixed use scheme which was granting cons granted consent down in Newton Abbott. Uh, and Charlie had promoted uh, this and was rather pleased um, about the result, quite understandably. Um, but anyway, the, uh, originally the case raised a number of issues, including um, the adequacy of the environmental statement, particularly with regard to climate change and greenhouse gases, the effects of the proposal on greater horseshoe bats, some heritage issues, and you will recall uh, some points about payments sought by Torbay and South Devon NHS Trust. In terms of the High Court challenge, the challenge focused on three substantive grounds. And before I get to those, I just want to paint a picture that this was a site allocated in a local plan, and it was very close to South Ham's special protected area, which comprised of five dispersed sites. And that area was protected and, and was designated in part because it hosts these greater horseshoe bats, which are particularly special bats. So that's the sort of uh, background and an appropriate assessment was required because of, because of that. So on to the three substantive grounds. Ground number one was that the um, Secretary of State had erred because he'd granted planning permission without having assessed any material environmental information relating to this greenhouse gas and climate change issue. So this is really an attack on the adequacy of the EIA on those grounds. And the judge found that, first of all, the Secretary of State had acted rationally in rejecting the claimant's submission about the adequacy of the environmental information. Uh, uh, alternatively, the inspect the uh, judge found that if there had been an error of law applying the simplex case it wouldn't have made any difference because the result would have been the same absent the legal er error and thirdly the point was made and I think this is the particularly interesting point that whatever the outcome of any greenhouse gas emission assessment it was clear from the decision that the secretary of, of the secretary that the secretary of state would not have reopened the local plan strategy Remember, this was an allocated site and the local plan strategy was that more homes are required and that urban extensions were a sustainable way of achieving that because, of course, of the reduction of travel and therefore carbon emissions that would come about. Uh, and so that was another factor which played in the judge's mind applying um, simplex. The second ground was that there had been uh, a failure to assess properly the likely significant effects, in particular on the bats, the protected species. And the judge said that the claimant's challenge didn't 
fully reflect the legal framework within which the Secretary of State's decision was made. And that although the EIA directive and the regulations provide that environmental effects are to be taken into account at the earliest possible stage and before consent is given, the case law has made clear that where a na national law provides for a multi-stage procedure, as we do with outline and um, reserve matters, then the environmental effects are identified and assessed at the outline stage and details of the development may be finalized at reserve matters. Uh, 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 and that in this state, in this case, the Secretary of State took full account of the various inadequacies, again, claimed by the claimants at the appeal uh, as to the content and the coverage of the environmental statement. And in particular, another important factor here was that natural England's views were taken into account by the Secretary of State and there had been a, 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 an additional survey that had been submitted and nat Natural England's views were sought and they were given considerable weight and there was uh, no reason, uh, to no cogent reason to depart from that. And so in the end that the judge concluded that the Secretary of State had actually made a number of rational planning judgments based on the evidence which couldn't have been impugned on any Wensbury grounds. And then the final uh, ground was based on Regulation 70 of the, hab the uh, Habitat regs, uh, which you'll all remember provides that um, planning permission, in this case outline, must not be granted unless the competent authority is satisfied, whether by reason of condition or limitation to which the outline permission is subject, that no development is likely to affect the integrity of the European site. So you have to prove a positive, but you can prove a positive, um, including by reference to conditions and limitations. And the judge said that it was quite apparent from the way that the claimant was putting their case, that essentially what they were saying was that all details, all details had to be provided at the outline stage. And the judge said that the effect of that argument, if successful, would effectively be to negate the outline and reserve matters approval system that we have in, in this country. Um, and that that was not uh, the correct approach. And that she was satisfied that the Secretary of State and indeed the inspector, because the Secretary of State had acted in accordance with the uh, inspector's recommendations, had not made any error of law. And so uh, well done to Guy Williams, who was acting for the Secretary of State and indeed Charlie Banner, who was following on. and. Commiserations to Estelle de Hon, who was acting for the claimants, uh, and no doubt the Par and the parish council, because no doubt their views were earnestly held. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thanks, Mary. Um, an interesting case about habitats in the IA. And now um, we go to Didcot with Paul and Didcot, um, a source of um, quite a few planning appeals in recent years. And you're going to tell us about the latest one, Paul. I, I will, Charlie, but before I, I do, I've got to say, if your haircut isn't on a YouTube meme by the end of uh, this session, then there's, there's no God. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's, it's mesmerising. <laughs> um, right, OK, so my appeal relates to um, uh, an appeal which was uh, dismissed on the 26th of February by Mr Inspector Baird. Uh, Mr Inspector Baird, obviously, well, doesn't have interaction with the inspector, but there's there's a backstory there sometimes you come in front of decision makers you go they're really interesting people i'd love to know what their backstory is i don't know what his backstory is but he's a uh, very interesting character to be in front of in a very positive way so outline permission for 325 dwellings uh, was applied for and not determined by south oxfordshire the application was uh, made as recently as august of 2019 and between august of 2019 and february of this year uh, those who've been keeping up with the news will have spotted something happen in South Oxfordshire. Well, it was the local plan was adopted, having been recovered by the, or having been intervened by the Secretary of State. Uh, and amongst the allocations in the local plan was not one uh, which involved this particular site by A2 Dominion on the east side of Didcot. And so th there were uh, putative reasons for refusal by the authority. Uh, uh, effect on the, the character of the area and the AONB, the North Wessex Downs AONB, highways, infrastructure in accordance with the development plan, uh, the latter being particularly relevant given the recent adoption of the uh, South Oxfordshire local plan, which happened after the inquiry. It's a large, flat, arable field. Uh, part of it is actually in the AONB, and the inspector 
uh, uh, interestingly indicated that the site was a valued landscape, even though it was ordinary landscape, but it was valued because of its context, but also concluded that it was harmful to the AOMB uh, and was very critical of the AOMB board for not responding to the uh, application at all, but didn't take no objection as being an acceptance that the scheme was acceptable. So fairly substantial impacts on character and appearance. Um, uh, highways, uh, the inspector concluded an additional five vehicles in the PMP wasn't a severe impact and he didn't need to form a view on infrastructure. But on the development plan, the inspector uh, indicated that the council could demonstrate a three year supply. Now, that's the interesting thing about this case, because everywhere else in the UK, every other shire county in England, rather, uh, you have to demonstrate a five year land supply, apart from Oxfordshire, where because of a written ministerial statement back in 2018, the test is a three year supply. Now, that might have made sense at the time, but now the South Oxfordshire local plan is in place. I struggle to understand why on earth that makes sense. Um, but nonetheless, that was the test and they could demonstrate it. So there wasn't a, a self-evident need for additional housing. And therefore, it was a fairly clear slam dunk dismissed appeal. It could have gone the other way for the developer. So by the time they got to the appeal, it could have been that the plan had fallen apart. Uh, but no, that, that didn't happen. And uh, this site fell by the wayside. So it's really the South Oxfordshire local plan that sank this particular scheme. But I do still wonder why on earth uh, this is a particular. This is a site where the judgment is against a three-year supply, not a five-year land supply. Thanks, Jolly. I'm sure it's got nothing to do with the local elections in May. Um, <laughs> 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 Perish the thought. Um, now, um, next up, uh, we, we touched briefly on the Bradford Green Belt um, decision last week, um, but uh, Chris is bursting to tell us more about it uh, and uh, tell us a full detailed report about what happened in that case. So, over to you, Chris. I am, Charlie, because it's Greenbelt and therefore it's absolutely essential for all our viewers, even Jules. The, um, now, as far as this case is concerned, uh, it's in Burley in Wharfdale, which Paul has made clear to me is not Bradford, although it might be in the administrative area of Bradford. And um, uh, Burley in Wharfdale at Sun Lane and Ilkley Road. And uh, it's a Secretary of State decision. And uh, it's for 500 houses on a greenfield site in the Greenbelt. So this is one of the biggest and most controversial decisions that you will ever see in planning. But hang on, it's not that controversial because the local authority represented by Martin Carter of Paul's Chambers was uh, supportive of the application. So it wasn't contested. It's what we call a sweetheart case where the barristers are on the other side, on, on the same side as each other. And um, uh, and James Strawn was acting for CEG, the developer. Um, now, this, the sequence of events is this case was actually the subject of an inquiry a couple of years ago. And the recommendation was to approve when the council had identified they need to take out 11,000 houses, land for 11,000 houses in the Greenbelt to meet their housing requirements. And the council in Bradford is a Labour council. Uh, but two days before the beginning of the PERDA period for the 2019 general election, this was refused. And it was no secret that the local MP, a Conservative MP, was bitterly opposed to the site, as indeed he remains bitterly opposed. But everybody else is looking completely nervous. What is Chris going to say next? <laughs> Nothing more. OK. It was <laughs> um, but... Uh, so there we had outright politics uh, between what the council wanted and what the MP didn't want. And uh, how relevant is that? So um, the decision was refused by the Secretary of State, but James Strawn um, and assisted by Martin Carter mounted a legal challenge and the decision was quashed. And the decision letter was riddled with errors, including treating the test for the release of land for a development management decision as an exceptional circumstance test, when we all know it's very special circumstances. So um, it was quite a series of errors uh, in that decision, which then led to the quashing. Um, and then we have another decision. Now, in this time round, the Secretary of State grants planning permission um, and obviously has nothing to do with any absence of any general elections in the next couple of years. 
Um, and if we turn to paragraph 18 and 19, uh, these are the key things, because we're all desperate to know, isn't it? How do you get home on very special circumstances? So paragraph 18 says that the Secretary of State, having noted the harm in the Greenbelt, the Secretary of State notes that in the draft Bradford District Local Plan, so um, this is more about the allocations, this plan, the core strategy had already identified how much to come out. But that draft Bradford District Local Plan currently out for consultation, Burley and Wharfdale's requirement to accommodate homes was 625 houses, and there is a preferred allocation for this site. And then paragraph 19, if we so it was the preferred allocation as far as the council was concerned. That's why they were supporting it. So um, if we look at paragraph 19, given his finding that the emerging plan should carry only limited weight, he agrees with the inspector that the application should be assessed against the established and adopted policy position. And Berlin Wharfdale has a confirmed status as a local growth centre under CS uh, under that policy and is required to accommodate 700 new homes. Exceptional circumstances have been demonstrated to justify using Greenbelt land. So that's a fundamental requirement, isn't it? That um, in this case, that the exceptional circumstances have been proved, albeit, albeit that isn't the test, because as we know, you need more than the exceptional circumstances because the Court of Appeal in the Luton and Central Beds case tells us that it's a higher threshold, very special circumstances. So exceptional circumstances uh, isn't enough. And we know from the Guildford High Court challenge that housing need may be enough to demonstrate exceptional circumstances, but that won't get you home on an application because of the, the very special circumstances test. So um, a lot of the controversy about the selection of the site was obviously dealt with through the plan process. If we just have a look at paragraph 44 briefly, I'm conscious of the time, but paragraph 44 uh, is the essence of uh, the case in terms of um, the benefits. We deliver a substantial number of homes, which attracts, uh, attracts very substantial weights, um, Given the poor housing supply position, it would provide a site for a new primary school, which attracts great weight. Well, usually proposals of that scale do. And there would be net benefits for biodiversity, which interestingly attracts significant weight. So that's a high, high weighting for that. And heritage, which attracts very significant weight. There were some benefits for a temporary Roman camp, which I think sounds like a very early motorway service station. And uh, economic benefits, new recreational benefits, um, and, uh, and those were given moderate weight. So th those, in effect, were the very special circumstances, and they outweighed the substantial harm to the Greenbelt. And planning permission, which probably should have been granted two years ago, was finally granted. Well done to everybody involved for getting that one home. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and the final appeal is uh, I'm going to cover um, rates to a site in a place called Moorthorpe in Sheffield, within the area of Sheffield City Council. It's an appeal by Avant Homes uh, against the refusal of planning permission for a 72 dwelling development on a greenfield site in a wider area called um, Owlthorpe. Um, now, the site was um, allocated, in fact, it been allocated for some time in, in a 1998 UDP as one of three allocated sites which formed together the Althorpe development area, which was the subject of uh, what was called a planning and design brief, essentially a development brief, um, a non-statutory document which was given some weight. Now, despite the allocation, permission had been refused on grounds which raised a number of issues, including ecology, character and appearance, making efficient use of land, whether the affordable housing had been successfully integrated, and whether the scheme would prejudice the proper planning of the wider uh, development area. Um, there was an uncontested five-year supply. The housing delivery test was above 100%, so it wasn't a tilted balance case. But the inspector allowed the appeal on the basis the scheme was in accordance with the development plan and indeed the framework. And on ecology, 
Um, the inspector agreed with the council that the site had a high level of biodiversity and was ec ecological value and that much of that would be lost. But the inspector went on to say, well, the site was allocated, so this loss couldn't be avoided. Uh, Off-site enhancements could live with a 10% net biodiversity gain. So ecology wasn't a basis for objecting. On character, the complaint, interesting enough, was that the gardens were back onto the, the borders of the site. So they'd be looking out uh, with the retaining wall at the end, which isn't really these days very good practice in terms of urban design. Um, and it was contrary to the, the development brief. Um, however, the inspector found that um, the topography of the site, it's not said why, but I imagine because it was steep, effectively, uh, and the levels meant that um, it, that was a reasonable response in the circumstances. And there were other existing dwellings in the area that also had the gardens backing, facing out. Um, on trees, um, the, the brief proposed a 15 metre buffer between the development and ancient woodland. Uh, there was some incursions to that buffer through car parking and various other ancillary uses, but no incursions in the root protection area of, of the ancient trees or within five metres of the canopy. The inspector thought that was compliant with the provision in the framework, paragraph 175, that you don't um, uh, allow development that would deteriorate ancient woodland in necessary exceptional circumstance. I must say in brackets, I thought that the buffer zones were more not about protecting the roots and the canopies, but avoiding inconsistent uses and disturbance, that sort of thing, but that doesn't seem to have been an issue. Um, on density, the development was quite low density compared to these day standards, 28 to 30 dwellings per hectare, despite the core strategy requiring 40 to 50 dwellings per hectare. But the inspector thought that was OK because the quantum of the allocation was delivered and it would be delivered in a way that was acceptable in design terms. No problem on the affordable housing integration or prejudice to the wider development uh, as well, and therefore the objections weren't well founded. Now, interesting, standing back, um, this is the second case we've talked about this week, which related to an allocated site. The case Mary talked about, the Woolworth development, 1,200 dwellings, uh, the cornerstone, in fact, of the council's five-year supply and local plan, had been allocated in 2014. Uh, yet it went to a recovered appeal inquiry in, um, in 2019, decision in 2020, judicial review in 2021, and who knows whether the Court of Appeal will grant permission to appeal. Um, and the Dorset appeal decision in Banford, Samaria, a couple of a few weeks ago, and there was another illustration of uh, an allocated site being resisted and a developer or promoter having to go through an inquiry appeal. Now, does this mean that perhaps for controversial sites, allocations are now providing less certainty than before, or less certainty they should be? Would the new regime under the Planning for the Future White Paper resolve the situation? Well, some people might say um, yes, because the growth areas where outline permission would be granted at the time of the, of the local plan adoption would have resolved it. On the other hand, it might be said that the fight would just be kicked down the road to the reserve matter stage. Um, I think that's an important chestnut that MHCLG are going to have to crack uh, in considering their response to the consultation. Um, so those are my thoughts. And now over to Sasha to introduce and, and start off the questions with Jules. Thank you very much, Charlie. Jules, good afternoon, and thank you so much for coming on. I, I think we all s salute you for being two things. One, willing to come on, which we're always delighted about. And two, we need politicians. They're critical and they're brave enough to stand up of whatever hue get my huge commendation for your public service. I know that sounds terribly American, but it's appropriate. Um, can we start off? Well, yeah, Sasha, I always rejected the the, uh, the term politician. I, I always regarded myself as an over-involved resident. <laughs> <laughs> can I can I start off? Obviously, it's wonderful you coming on, particularly in the light of the adoption of the London plan. Uh, and can I start off by saying, you know, how excited are you about the ability of the London plan to direct development in the next, well, short term, medium term, and longer term in London? Yeah, well, it's, it's probably odd to be excited about something that's, um, you know, it's been about five years in the anticipation. Um, but actually, I am really excited about, as you say, about its implementation. Um, it's, it's great to, to, to have reached this point. And, and I'll put, speaking personally, I mean, it's great for the team. There's a fantastic team of planners we have um, at, at City Hall. Uh, and under Jen Peters and then um, Lisa Fairmanner, who've uh, overseen the plan process with this great team of uh, uh, planning policy professionals underneath them. I, I, I've really, it's, it's really satisfying getting to this point where, you know, we've got a, an opportunity to implement a load of innovative uh, approaches. You know, the threshold uh, approach uh, to affordable housing that's been, you know, really becoming effective in the couple of years that it's been the SPG. Now it's well cemented. Um, in the plan. Um, 
uh, you know, seeing high industrial, um, uh, high density industrial schemes being uh, uh, brought forward as well. Already, we've, we, we're seeing a couple of double and treble deck uh, uh, schemes come forward. Uh, innovative mixed use uh, schemes. Um, uh, you know, the urban greening uh, factor as well. Actually, already seeing people introduce those in, a, in advance of the plan being fully adopted uh, or fully published. That's uh, being technically accurate. Um, uh, yeah, it's 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 uh, it's it's really great. Right. Now, obviously, one of the things for noteworthy is the sheer scale and the ambition of the plan in terms of housing delivery, employment, land, and the growth that London is expected to have over the next twenty years. Um, one of the issues of concern might be said about housing delivery from the recent past and its relative um, relative failing against targets. I mean, why do you ascribe the, the non-delivery, so to speak, of housing in the recent past in London? Well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a really um, difficult picture. It's complex and, and a lot of kind of competing data. Uh, I think out there. What's one thing about the, the competing data? We're hoping to get through, cut through that with the London Data Hub. Um, you know, that is going to make things very clear now about exactly who is permissioning what, how many applications, where, and right through to the delivery and delivering what, right down to square meterage and, and numbers of bedrooms, and and done in in live in li- real real time um, as well. You know, updated daily. Um, uh, not sort of after a couple of months that the old LDD uh, was uh, 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 how that used to operate. So it's, I think it's really good that we're going to soon be able to cut through all, all, all the debate about exactly um, what is being delivered and what not. I think it's been really bumpy in recent years. Uh, we did have a high a couple of years ago uh, at 41,000. It's dipped last year, and I think that's what's causing a lot of people to comment. But the latest figures are back up again, um, and we'll think we'll be back up at that 40. Uh, for about 42,000 mark for 1920. Um, we certainly don't recognise the central government figures of around 20, 22,000. Um, the EPC data is, is practically double that. And that's far more reliable, I think, than the, the kind of the almost the self-reporting that goes on to create the figures that, that CLG have. Um, but as I say, it, delivery clearly has been very lumpy. Um, uh, but obviously not in terms of permissions. What uh, you know, the, your, largely your audience, of course, are, are in, engaged in the math, matter of uh, securing permissions um, rather than laying uh, laying the bricks on the ground. And there is a very healthy pipeline of uh, uh, of, of permissions out there, which uh, need to be delivered. And, and it's not the planning system that's that's preventing them from being being delivered. It's it's an awful lot of a lot of other factors and a lot of that down to infrastructure and, and funding. Well, funding, it's interesting you say that because certainly in the recent appeals I've done in London, viability is always a major, major question. Mm. Um, it, and, when, t- and when money's available for, for affordable housing in terms of grant, often people are using that to actually make the, make the things more viable and bring them, bring them forward earlier than they would. Mm. I mean, how, what do you see as the relationship of viability in relation to the adoption in the borough's core strategies? What, what approach do you think is going to be taken in the future about viability in the specific core strategies? Well, I mean, the, I think, you know, a lot of this, of course, is, is, um, is, is directly connected with, uh, with the, the value of land and the price of land that people um, are paying. And I think the you know, the, 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 the pr- clear approach that we've taken in the plan, I think, is really helping um, developers not overpay uh, for land. And I think that's feeding through into the viability of a lot of schemes. I mean, in the time I've been at City Hall, um, you know, the, the, the trajectory of the amount of affordable housing um, that comes baked into to, to the applications, um, it's, it's transformed. It was in the teens, in the low teens um, in 2016 when we started. And now the average um, uh, that we're achieving, um, I think over, uh, over the last year was about something like 41, 42%. I think three quarters of the referred applications we see are more than 35% baked in. So I think already the, 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 the viability is, is, has already been transformed um, as a result of the SPG. And as you can imagine, what, probably one of the biggest issues crossing your desk is climate change and the serious nature of the problem we face. W- what do you say to those watching about how the 
the GLA and the mayor will be committed to tackling climate change through planning and planning decisions in the future? Well, I mean, addressing it features very heavily um, in the plan, you know, and obviously a, 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 in parallel to the plan, the mayor's rightly declared a, a climate emergency and, and made it clear that, um, you know, the recovery from COVID has got to be a, a, a green recovery in, in, all, in all respects. Um, mayor's, uh, one of his greatest priorities has been about air quality. Um, and uh, we've seen the introduction of the ULES um, and, and the expansion um, of that. Um, uh, 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 you know, on, on track. Um, but obviously the planning system is absolutely key um, to tackling tackling this. Um, and, and, the London, and the London plan does it in a number of ways. Um, you know, obviously we're very keen to promote a very sustainable pattern um, of development, not car dependent um, things flung out on the, on the periphery. Um, you know, we want to make sure that places that, you know, people in which people live and work and, 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 and visit are very well connected by public transport. And that's also where they're already well connected. That's where we concentrate um, development, um, maximizing good routes for walking uh, and cycling. Um, and the net zero carbon policies and the air quality neutral policies in, in, in the plan, along with the urban greening factor that I mentioned, um, the circular economy principles that are in the plan as well. I mean, there's a, there's a, I think it's a really rich um, seem of things in, in, in the plan that are all focused um, on, on, on climate change um, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a greener, living in a greener place. Mm. Now, one of the things that no doubt you saw in your happy years was about pu public participation in planning. Um, and it, as we know from the white paper, one of the concerns of central government is, is the perception of those residents population about planning what 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 is your approach to increasing public participation and buy into the planning system in the future yeah um i think uh, you know digitalization is going to play a, a a big part part in this um we've tried various uh things you know some of them obvious like uh, social media um digital engagement when we've gone out with our OP, oaps um uh, you know, and there's things like commonplace uh, that we've we've used. Um, clearly, the last year has shown the ability for Zoom and, and Teams and and similar kind of things for for, for to to expand uh, um, uh, uh, participation. I'm not sure whether handful district council though is a kind of like has turned people off though as opposed to it's certainly engaged people anyway. Um, uh, um, you know, the, um, the Mayor's Civic Innovation Challenge as well has supported the development of plan base. Um, so obviously we're looking to, uh, a, 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 in a big way, you know, to grow 3D um, imaging uh, as a way of, uh, of, of getting people to really immerse themselves in what a, what a plan is, is, is all about. So we're hoping to use that more in future consultations. Um, but we also know that, you know, we really need to continue engaging in person. And, and once, you know, this isn't, um, the, the, I've always thought that these kind of things are additional, not to displace um, actually, you know, real face to uh, uh, face engage, engagement. And there will always be groups that you really need to go out and reach out to uh, and not expect them to come in and, and use whatever tools you come up with. But just because you've provided the tools, assuming people uh, will will come and use them, and if they don't come and use them, they're not interested. I've always thought that 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 that's wrong. Um, and um, you know, when, when, I mean, as an example, you know, when when we were developing the Public London uh, Charter, you know, we engaged with young people through the Stephen Lawrence Trust to you know get their views on public spaces and how they ought to be uh, used. You know, whether what they found welcoming, what they didn't find welcoming. Um, you know, so so there's 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 a, there's a lot of lot of ways that we can uh, that we know about should use, and ones we don't know about yet, and we should be ready to explore them and, and use them. And obviously, the London plan evolved in an earlier period when we could all go out for a drink. I mean, we've had the implications and effects of COVID. What what do you think is is the long term consequences of COVID for the planning system? How 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 is the GLA addressing it? Mm. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's had a proud, profound effect on 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 our lives, on everybody's uh, lives, and and uh, no more, you know, no more so in particular particular vulnerable groups. And we've seen heroic efforts from public services. Um, we've witnessed, um, you know, incredible uh, uh, things from from our from our public servants. Um, but you know, but for, for, for kind of people like me, I suppose it's it's the impact has been 
uh, uh, far more, um, you know, gentle and subtle. It's about remote working. Um, uh, and, you know, maybe, the, you know, I think it's over the next couple of years, I think we're all going to be exploring um, whether the benefits are real or imagined about, you know, work-life balance, better work-life balance um, uh, and, 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 the po- and the supposed positive impacts. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, su- I'm absolutely sure that there are plenty ne- of negatives to be, uh, uh, to, be ba- it for it to be balanced off against. Um, I think the potential uh, damage to collaborative working, creativity, uh, those water cooler moments, waiting for the lift moments if you're at City Hall. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's, that's, I think, really problematic. And, 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 you know, even just the mixed economy of home working and office and how that works in, in practice, um, I think, uh, again, there's a lot to explore and, and unpack there. I think, you know, on the plan, uh, I do get asked a lot, obviously, does it mean, say, that the plan has to be revised as a result of all these things that we intend to do as a result of, 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 the, of a, a good recovery from COVID? And actually, no, it's, it's already in there. You know, whether, whether it's about uh, the right kind of space at home or office or externally um, and all the green things that I was talking about earlier, um, I don't think there's anything additional that needs to be in the plan. I think what the issue is about implementation. I think, you know, if, if it changes something in, about the plan, it's the fact that it's made it, a, a, you know, it's a greater imperative to a, a implement all those policy, positive policies that maybe before the cynics thought, well, is a nice to have, you know, all this urban greening stuff, is that really necessary? You know, public realm, really, you know, we're, we're kind of building a building here, you know, the outside bit, someone else's problem, isn't it? Whereas, you know, the more forward thinking developers didn't think that anyway. But now I think there's a real, you know, they, they, were, they were really signed up to the whole green agenda and, 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 and public realm. I just think this means that everyone just needs to get on board now. Mm. Thank you so much. Well, uh, let me open it up to the rest of the panel. Chris, would you like to ask a question of Jules? I would. I would. Thank you very much, Sasha. So, uh, Jules, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my question is, uh, when will there be a Green Belt review? <laughs> Ah, well, um, <laughs> I, 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 I'd come back with a question, should there be a Green re- Belt, belt Review? Uh, okay. and, and if there should be, who should do it? Yes, but I've been saying to my witnesses all day, Jules, that they can't ask me questions. They have to answer mine. <laughs> so maybe maybe if I'm being a bit gentler, because you're not being cross-examined, maybe I could say, since the Secretary of State isn't um, satisfied with the numbers in the plan, then... When is that going to be looked at again? When is there going to be a review to address that issue? Yeah. Um, well, obviously we've got a mayoral election uh, coming up, um, and we've got, and there'll be obviously a, a point over the next few months about establishing priorities, you know, for the new uh, for the new mayoral term. Um, there are obviously lots of things hanging around in the air, like the government's ongoing review um, of the planning system. Um, so certainly we think that, you know, trying to get a definitive programme together for a London plan review, it's, it's really premature um, at, at the moment. Um, we're not complacent, though. There's obviously always going to be a lot of work going on uh, about um, updating, uh, you know, evidence, key evidence on whether it's industrial land supply, employment sites, uh, town centres and high streets, Um, affordability and land values um, uh, and obviously housing uh, need being right at the 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 top of that Um, you know so um, we will keep keep on 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 top of uh, on top of uh, of that Um, you know we're obviously keen to ensure that we keep pushing the innovative approaches in the London plan the small sites policy it it's remained intact. It didn't get taken out in, uh, as a result of the uh, EIP. Um, but obviously, the inspector thought, how much appetite is there for delivery of that policy um, out, in, particularly in outer London? And therefore, I'm not going to give you the 12,000 uh, uh, units a year that the policy you're saying the policy will, will deliver. Um, I don't know, should we be st- revisiting that and thinking more about that. If, if I, I, I mean, I think what was interesting is that the, the, the Secretary of State came back um, with a, a very harsh letter about housing delivery, as, as, as everyone knows. 
But in the in the eleven um, directions and the two subsequent directions, none of them actually addressed housing delivery, other than the one about industrial land, maybe. And we can unpack unpack that and whether that really has an effect on on housing delivery. Um, so wh where are they going to be built? Um, because if uh, if no candidate uh, and that's in central government or any between central government, regional government and local government, you don't find many candidates who expect to win um, uh, extolling the virtues of building on the green belt. Um, and there's an issue about height now. Um, and so uh, I, I, unless we're all going to become troglodytes, um, I think we need to kind of unpack uh, where this additional housing is going, going to be built. Uh, maybe a, a national debate about uh, garden cities, garden towns, um, uh, maybe that's that's an appropriate thing. But without regional planning in place, uh, I think it, a, a London and South East conversation about that is going to be very difficult. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, M Mary, have you got a question for Jules? Yes, thank you very much. Um, very interesting, Jules. I, I completely agree with a lot of what you said right at the outset. One of the things I really noticed about you, Jules, and I love your description about describing yourself as an over-involved resident. Well, if you started off getting elected uh, when you were about 30, I think, as an over-involved resident, now I say you've done very well since. My, my question really is about how can we get more young, over-involved residents into local politics and I sort of feel that the time is ripe in the sense that as you say digitalization is is upon us um, government wants to see a lot more of it you've mentioned your London data hub which will make it much easier and it'll be free for everybody to see uh, what permissions are being granted I mean that's a great resource uh, and the advent of um, planning committees determining applications via Zoom has meant that lots of people have been able to access that process in a way they haven't done before. So it seems to me that the time is ripe. Now, what, what tips have, have you got or what, what, what do you think that uh, needs to happen to encourage more youngsters to come forward? Because I think youngsters have got a lot to offer. Hmm. Yeah, they, they certainly have. And whenever it's kind of discussed about young people um, uh, and, and, oh, they're not interested in politics, uh, that's uh, not true, is it? It's they're actually very interested in politics and issues. It's what they're turned off by is party politics often. Indeed, um, and often how it's how it's happens. Uh, well, whether it's national and indeed whether it's local, none of it of, often when it's seen um, in in all its gory detail, it doesn't look particularly attractive. And party meetings even less attractive um, uh, to, to young people. Um, I mean, I think. Winding back a bit, it's got to start in schools more. I think it's a real opportunity in schools to, to teach civics properly and, 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 and people to learn, you know, well, who does run the local health service? Yeah. Who's responsible for that? Who's responsible for cleaning the streets? Who's responsible for whether there's enough housing? And I think for kids to come out of school age 16 um, uh, and, and get, you get to 16 and, and not really know that, I think is a, is, is a terrible shame. Because although it kind of would seem very dry at the time, and I don't deny that, it will actually give them the basic grounding to, to realise as they get older that why they really ought to go out and vote when they're 18 and think about standing for election or engaging some way in the political process rather than issue by issue. Because as much as I can have a downer on political parties and the way they operate and engage, they are, when they work well, you know, party politics is a useful way to navigate otherwise complex um, uh, uh, collective decisions and a way of organising and corralling a, a debate for, for, and a, for and against. So I think they, really, they absolutely have uh, value and they should have a future. Um, I just wish they'd get a bit more... Um, Education, by the sound of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. It also would open up all those potential job opportunities. Um, you know, uh, uh, jobs in planning, for example, jobs in local government, for example, which a lot of youngsters, unless they've got mum, dad or auntie involved, wouldn't have any idea about. 
I, I got asked to um, uh, speak at a, a school in, in uh, um, Hackney. I, I don't usually, I, I try and uh, avoid, um, uh, I, I did a fair bit of that when I was uh, at Hackney Council. But, but now at City Hall, I, I can't cover all the schools in London. So I, I don't want to go, so before anyone asks me, I can't come and talk to, to, to six form. But, uh, uh, every school in London, but I did make an exception for a school that had a that six ball. Um, they introduced an architecture, uh, an engineering. Um, well, it wasn't a course; it wasn't a formal course. Um, um, you know, it's not an A level, but it was for interest of their students who were interested in going on doing that in 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 uh, uh, for at uh, degree level. Um, and of course, they were having a succession of architects through. I imagine talking to them about you know here's something beautiful I designed and uh, built. And I thought, actually, who's going to talk to them about who gives, in the widest sense of the term, permission to do things within public, public space? And public in the widest term, again, that you see, you know, something built at the end of the street. What gives someone the right to do something? And in terms of making a plan as well, what gives someone the right to decide, actually, we don't know what's going to be built there, but we're going to make some rules about what can and can't be built there. And who's deciding that on your behalf? And so I kind of took them through um, as, and tried to make it as interesting as I possibly could for 18, uh, you know, 17 year olds um, about you know, the London plan and about this, is, this book is full of stuff that you care about and it's all stuff in this book so that you know, planning professionals and architects and everyone can kind of say, okay, we've got to stick within these rules. So what we build is what people people want to see. Thank you. Brilliant. Right, Charlie, do you want to ask your question? Um, yes, before I die of frostbite up here on the roof. Um, Jules, um, I, I occurred to me this afternoon, It's it, next year, it's, it's a decade since the London Olympics. How time has flown. Um, and as someone who's, who's lived in Hackney for much of that time, it's been a huge amount of change. That's why I came up here on the roof. I think I'm literally surrounded by new development that's happened, um, much of which has happened since the London Olympics, most of which has been beneficial. So my, my question to you, really, or, or question and a half is, what do you think the single best legacy for London um, has been at the Olympics? And, and the, the half extra is, um, if there's one more thing of the legacy that you'd like to see achieve, what would that be? Ooh, um, I mean, I think the Olympics for London showcased what a forward-thinking um, global city could could look like it was the um sort of the, the greenest olympics so far and with one or two unfortunate exceptions um the the the, the buildings were built for uh for the future for future use and almost kind of retrofitted for the four weeks of the olympics and the paralympic games um it all went wrong with the stadium because people changed mission halfway through which is always a dangerous thing it was never meant to stay up it wasn't meant to be a football stadium in the original plan and now it's a hybrid thing and and it works for football it has to work for athletics and other events as um as well and lldc do make a great success of it for what they've been given but what they've been given is a is a is a is a challenge um, whereas the park, the wider park, works brilliantly and many of the facilities in it, whether it's the velodrome, and I think that's a real showcase of what, uh, of what London could achieve. And the event was pulled off uh, with great aplomb. So, again, really put us um, um, as a great advert um, uh, for, the, um, uh, for London. I mean, I suppose I think I've thought more in the past uh, about what it did for the, for the borough. Um, you know, we had a, when, we, when we did our... When we did the, the Hackney weekend with all these kind of global stars who, who rocked up on the marshes over two days, we ended up having a, a leader column in the Times on the Monday talking about the borough and ha the distance it had travelled um, in the sort of a decade um, or so in standing up and taking its place, rightful place in a kind of amongst sort of uh, public bodies that could, that did try to do its best for, for local people and deliver, deliver something. Um, so, so it was, so that was, that was a great moment and, and it did kind of put us on the map for that. But I have to say, is, it, did Hackney transform uh, because of the Olympics? I have to say no. 
it, it doesn't come in my top three. My, my top three would be the turnaround in schools. So it became a borough that people tried to get into to send their kids to the schools rather than get out of. Um, the second thing is transport and the East London line extension and the North London line, the changes and making them part of London Overground and having a, a really regular uh, service that connected you with the tube uh, network. So you could get in to spend money in the Hackney Empire and you can get home again and equally you can get from Hackney into work easily and willing to take jobs the other side of London, even if they would have otherwise been inconvenient. So that's the second thing. And the third thing was the council getting its act together to provide, you know, basic services properly like street cleaning. And I think those three things transformed the reputation of the borough up till the time I left in 2016. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's a great place to live. Great. Paul, what's your question for Jules? Uh, Jules, Jules London, London's a bit weird. And I say that from the perspective of being nor a northerner uh, and also uh, um, in the context of, a, of planning. And it's probably the highlight of my career to say to the Deputy London Mayor, London's a bit weird. But London's a bit weird in terms of the planning system, because unlike other planning authorities and unlike other cities in England, you've got this strategic planning authority, which has the power of recovery. You've got a unique insight from the perspective of Hackney and also your current perspective as Deputy Mayor. Is this a system that should be rolled out? And I should say, when I formulated this question, I didn't realise that Lord Sainsbury was going to write a, a report called Centre for Cities today where he advocates exactly that. What's your view? Well, I'm going to be careful not to advocate it for elsewhere because I'll get... So who are you, who are you to make these recommendations for, for outside, you, you bloody Londoner? But I will say that the system works very well. Um, you know, uh, you know the, the, the schemes that are decided by the mayor, of course, are the, are the tip of the iceberg. You know, there are hundreds of schemes that are referred uh, to the mayor uh, that have principally been decided by the boroughs, and, and, and he gets a, a second look at them. Um, but obviously, you know, co combined, the, the ability to recover... Uh, combined with, you know, the setting of the strategic plan and looking at, at all those uh, strategic, hundreds of strategic applications a year, it, it really does mean that, you know, the, the level of ambition in the plan is, is, is reflected in, in those decisions. Um, you know, there's greater consistency across London as a, as a result, I think. Um, and uh, the mayor can intervene as, as, as a last resort if it's lacking in that consistency. And maybe that local decision was swung, um, unfortunately, um, uh, and, and it, needs a, it needs a second look. I think the stats um, that I've mentioned about the increase in affordable housing um, and, you know, more than three quarters that come to us now um, offer more than 35%. I think that's that's probably the key key output that I would say is, is endorses it as a as, as a system. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jules. You've been brilliantly informative. Thank you so much on behalf of all of us, Charlie. Back to you. I, I sorry, that's it. Thank you very very much. And I never would uh, imagine that being uh, grilled by um, QCs would have uh, five QCs would have been uh, would have been uh, something I'd still be smiling about at the other side. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I hope you'll come back in future again. We'd love that. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Please do. Thank you very much for me too, Jules. It's really been a pleasure to have you on. Now we've got Champion of the Week, which Paul, you're going to do. Yeah, I'm going to take you out of London, I'm afraid. And that's not just because of the, the way in which I phrased the last question. I'm going to take you out of the country. I'm going to take you into the Principality of Wales because Champion of the Week is a long overdue champion. And behind the scenes, those, those on the panel know that I think it's a long overdue champion. And that's because uh, the Principality of Wales uh, at the back end of last month uh, brought forward Future Wales, a national strategic plan for the whole of the Principality, which replaced the 2008 plan and ironically is brought forward under the same acts that we prepare development plans. Maybe a move towards more spatial planning elsewhere in the UK, who knows? So, Champion of the Week, Wales. Cheers, Paul. Well done, Wales. Mary, who are you nudging this week? Well, I'm going to, at the invitation of Victoria Hills, Jules, I'm going to nudge you. <laughs> will, will you write urgently, please, to the Minister to seek a U-turn on the proposed PDR relaxation for Class E? 
with a move with a move to flexible uh, a more flexible approach which protects basically essential services on the high street whilst breathing new life into them already done oh brilliant <laughs> two steps ahead already very good <laughs> thanks mary well that's it for this week thanks again to jules for a really fascinating insight into all things london london plan um I would raise my London Pride uh, bottle, but it's been blown over in the wind. It's now in about Charlie, five, Charlie, five can, different pieces. Charlie, can I just say, I, I broadcast from the roof on one occasion, but I did it in July. You must be <laughs> absolutely frozen. I've lost control of my fingers, it must be said. I just hope I don't <laughs> lose any fingers. <laughs> but there we are. Now, next week, we've got um, another um, over-involved resident, um, the Minister of Planning, um, Chris Pincher, um, who is going to come and speak to us. Uh, we'll be publishing details about that and the arrangements for that um, uh, probably on Monday. Uh, in the meantime, um, have a good Friday tomorrow. Have a good weekend after that. And hopefully I will have thawed by, uh, by this time next week. Charlie, See can we then. just say, can we just say ever so briefly, there's lots of people who are doing the virtual sleep out for land aid tonight and uh, good luck to them because uh, it is a pretty cold and windy night as you attest to you're right <laughs> take care thanks chris and uh, well done to them good thanks, evening bye-bye thanks again jules pleasure